Good evening, everyone. My name is Savannah Mapes, and I will be your co-host this evening. Oh, I will be your main host this evening. My two co-hosts are Caitlin and Ashley. I'm Caitlin Clark. Uh, I am a second year uh, student here at VIMS and a Virginia Sea Grant Graduate Re Research Fellow, and I'll be handling the Q&A session. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley King. I'm also a second year here at VIMS, and I'll be handling uh, prizes, so wait to see me at the end. I want to welcome you all to our Virtual Scientist Walks Into a Bar event. Tonight, you are going to hear from three graduate students from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, or as we call it, VIMS. For those of you who are not familiar with VIMS, it is a research institution located in Gloucester Point, Virginia, that has been focused on coastal and estuarine science in the Chesapeake Bay and beyond since 1940. It is also the graduate school of marine science for William and Mary. VIMS has a three-part mission to conduct research, educate students and the public, and provide advisory service to the state of Virginia. We offer many public education programs throughout the year, such as tonight's event, and we would love for you to join us for more of our programs. You can find out about all of our upcoming programs on our website at vims.edu or by signing up for our e-newsletter, e-tidings, that goes out once a month. Scientist Walks Into a Bar, Grad Student Edition, started as a VIMS graduate student version of an existing event that has gained popularity in recent years. We've previously held these events in local breweries and tap rooms, but as you can imagine, that is not possible at the moment. But the show must go on. So we have adapted our event to bring it to you virtually tonight. For tonight's event, we will have three graduate students present to you each providing a five minute fast talk about their upcoming research, followed by 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Our speakers have made great infographics about their research, which they will show during discussion time. Now, without further ado, let's get to our program. Our first speaker of the night is Kristen Sharp, a third year master's student in the biological sciences department at FEMS. She is also a Commonwealth of Virginia National Science Foundation and Kelly Watson Memorial Fellow. Kristen received her bachelor's degree from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. If she could be any marine animal, she would be a whale shark because they are beautiful, universally loved, gentle giants, and they get to feast on her beloved plankton all day. Kristen, take it away. Thank you so much, Savannah. So as Savannah mentioned, my name is Kristen Sharp, and I am a ma uh, master's student at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science here. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to be telling you about my research on zooplankton migration and its role in the global carbon cycle. So the word zooplankton comes from two words, zo, which means animal, and planktos, which means drifter. Zooplankton are all of the animals who drift with the currents from microscopic organisms, including little crustaceans called copepods, to young crabs, and also including young fishes, all the way to large animals like jellyfishes. Zooplankton live in all water bodies, from freshwater lakes to the ocean. They also live in every zone of the ocean, from the surface down to the deepest parts of the sea. And one really unique thing about zooplankton is that while they can't control their movement from side to side, they can actually swim up and down for very long distances because they're not being swept by the currents when they're moving up and down in the water column. So they're really great migrators. And in fact, relative to their body size, some zooplankton actually perform the absolute largest migration of any animal on earth every single day. And we call this diol vertical migration where zooplankton change their location in the water column depending on the time of day. So during the day in the surface of the ocean, we have these tiny little plants called phytoplankton, which much like the plants on land use the sun's energy and carbon dioxide gas from the atmosphere to create sugars. And these nutrient rich phytoplankton are a really tasty meal for zooplankton, but there are far too many predators around in the surface waters during the day to risk being around to eat them. So to avoid the predators, the zooplankton spend the daylight hours in the deeper dark waters where the sunlight does not reach and then at night, they come up to the surface to take advantage of the darkness to more safely graze on the juicy phytoplankton. And then as the sun comes back up, the zooplankton start their migration back down to the deep. And when the zooplankton make it down to their daytime home, they relax and they digest the food that they ate at the surface. And just like any other animal, zooplankton poop 
So all of the nutrients, including carbon that was not used to grow or reproduce is pressed into fecal pellets, which they release into the water. And these fecal pellets are heavy, so they sink down to deeper waters. And pellets sink fairly slowly, which is not what's represented by this slide here, but it takes months or sometimes even years for them to make it to the deep sea. And along the way, the pellets may be eaten by bacteria, zooplankton, or larger animals. And this is actually a really important source of food in the deep sea. And only around 20% of the pellets that are created by zooplankton in the surface waters make it below 1,000 meters depth. But any remaining pellets can continue to sink down, and they may eventually make it all the way to the seafloor. Now, less than 1% of the pellets make it to the seafloor, where they can be eaten by animals that live at the bottom of the ocean, or they can be buried in the sediments. And if they're buried in the sediments, they're removed from the system for thousands to millions of years. And this movement of animals and their pellets has been called the carbon elevator because it's a very important way that carbon is transported from the top floor, if you will, the atmosphere, down into the basement, which is the ocean and ultimately removed from the environment. And the carbon elevator helps to remove 6 million tons of carbon from the atmosphere per year. And it's estimated that if we didn't have the carbon elevator, we would have up to 50% more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere which would be an issue because carbon dioxide is actually one of the major gases that contributes to climate change. So that leads me to my two major research questions. The first being, is dial vertical migration, that movement of animals during the day and night, occurring in the Chesapeake Bay? And the second being, what role do these Chesapeake Bay zooplankton have in this carbon elevator process? So answering these questions is a three-part process for me. I go out on a research boat once per month during both the day and night to collect animals from the York River. I collect a sample to identify and also a sample to weigh. And I then collect live animals, which I use to perform fecal pellet production experiments. So essentially, I keep the animals in containers where they can feast on tasty phytoplankton and create fecal pellets, which I can then collect and process for their carbon contents. And with these three bits of information, I can get a good idea of the changes in zooplankton in the surface waters in the day versus at night, and how these changes are corresponding to changes in fecal pellet production. And so far, I've been able to address the first of my research questions, which is whether diel vertical migration is occurring in the bay. And in short, yes, absolutely. In almost every single one of my sampling dates, four of which I've included here, um, I found a higher biomass or weight of animals in the surface at night versus during the day. And there's an especially higher amount of some of the medium-sized animals, which makes sense since they're such awesome vertical migrators. And some of the animals that we collect at night, we only see at night, like these mycid shrimps in the photo here, which spend the day down near the bottom of the river. And in previous studies at VIMS, these animals have been found to be in the stomach contents of almost all juvenile or young fishes that were collected by scientists so we know that they're a really important food source for fishes. So I'm hoping that my research will help to shed more light on the populations of these animals that we can usually only collect and observe at night. And the second portion of my research work will be answering the question of what role these animals play in the carbon elevator, which I am very excited to uncover those results in the future. And I've included my contact information here. And with that, I am happy to answer questions that you may have about my research or just zooplankton in general. And thank you so much. Fantastic presentation, Kristen. Thank you so much. Now, while I wait for the questions to roll in, I do have a question myself. Sure. Um, what is your favorite zooplankton? I know you love them all, but if you could pick one, which would mm. it be and why? I think I would have to choose. I wish I had a photo of it to show you. It's called Tomopterus. It's a really amazing um, polychaete worm. So it has a whole bunch of legs and it kind of just drifts in the water. Um, when I was in Antarctica this year, we caught a bunch of them. They were beautiful and they're really incredible animals. So I really liked them for sure. That's awesome. Um, and we do have a few audience questions. Um, so our first one is, could your results be the same for other bays? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind of part of the idea with my research questions is that ultimately there's only been what I could find was less than five studies that were looking at fecal pellet production in estuaries and none of them were looking at it from a community level. So I'm studying 
how many fecal pellets the entire community of zooplankton creates, which hasn't really, based on my research, been done before, which is very exciting. Um, and as far as the diel vertical migration, absolutely. So um, plankton are known, zooplankton, I should say, are known to migrate vertically in most water bodies that have any significant amount of depth differences. Um, so even in like freshwater lakes, you can see the vertical migration of zooplankton if the lake is deep enough. So absolutely, yeah. Awesome. Um, I love this question because I love in fauna. Um, but the question is, once the fecal pellets enter the sediment, are they a food source for the in fauna? Absolutely, yes. So they are eaten by shock full, nutrient rich um, <laughs> food source for a lot of different animals, including things like amphipods, isopods, um, worms. So yeah, they're definitely a huge food source. And then in turn, those animals create fecal pellets, which then get pushed back into the water. And those can be broken down into their little um, nutrient or mineral components, which can then be used by the plankton. So it's kind of like a beautiful circular movement of life there. <laughs> awesome. And we have a request to define, or what is in fauna? What, what is meant by that term? In fauna, yeah. So that's all of the animals that are living inside the sediments, essentially. So things that burrow, or maybe they like make little, uh, like, bur well, yeah, they burrow, <laughs> or they like, they dig into the sediment, basically. <laughs> Sweet. Um, so we have a question. Which zooplankton have been found to contribute most to the carbon elevator? Yeah, so um, one that is extremely important as far as the carbon elevator goes are salps. So salps are a type of gelatinous zooplankton. Um, they're commonly found in open ocean systems, but they typically aren't found year round. They kind of like bloom almost. So similar to like when you see in the Chesapeake Bay when there's a whole bunch of jellyfish in the summertime, it's similar to that. So um, typically in like the spring to summer is when you would get like a salp bloom. Um, and these salps create these really, really, really dense little fecal pellets. They almost look like uh, shredded wheat <laughs> is how I would describe them. Um, and they sink up to 10 times faster than most of the like copepod and other small zooplankton fecal pellets. So they're kind of disproportionately important as far as the carbon elevator goes. They're kind of like seen as like the carbon express train. Um, so they move that carbon from the atmosphere to the deep sea much quicker than most of the other animals that I'm studying. Sweet. And I love that you mentioned jellyfish because one of our other questions is, do jellyfish vert vertically migrate? Yeah, so a little bit. So it depends on which species. Um, so there's true jellyfishes, which are like things like sea nettles. Um, those ones are not, at least from my research in the Chesapeake Bay, are not significant diel vertical migrators. They kind of seem to hang out around the surface all day, presumably because they don't really have many predators in the bay. Um, they have a few, but not many, like some of these tiny, tiny little animals do. Um, if anything, the nettles actually eat the other zooplankton. So they're kind of eating the ones that are found in the surface during the day and also at night. Um, but there are other gelatinous or jelly zooplankton um, called like comb jellies. They're really good vertical migrators. So typically we won't see as many during the day toes as we do at night. So when I go out at night, I collect a whole bunch of them, which is kind of cool because they also bioluminesce. So they shine bright neon green when you move them in the water, which is really incredible to watch. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, someone asked, do zooplankton migrate via buoyancy or by actively swimming? Active swimming, yeah. So they don't have like a swim bladder like um, fishes do to regulate their vertical movement in the water. So typically, yeah, they're actually actively swimming up and down. Um, so zooplankton like copepods are very, very good swimmers. So they are the fastest animal per like body size on earth. So um, if you ever get like a little petri dish of them, if you try to look at one, it'll be gone in a half of a, a blink of an eye. <laughs> they're really hard to, to nail down <laughs> if they're alive. Oh my gosh, I've never thought of copepods as like the cheetahs of the sea, but that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so someone asked how, well, this, this is from Linda, um, the, our Dean of Academic Studies. Um, who asked how big is a copepod fecal pellet? She wants to know if she could tell the difference between a copepod fecal pellet from one made by like a benthic worm. 
Ooh, yeah, that's a really great question. So um, actually a fellow graduate student at VIMS, Kristen Wright, um, she studies sediment transport in the York River and she's actually sent me a few photos of polychaete, so worm fecal pellets, and they actually look very similar to the copepod fecal pellets. So particularly like some of the smaller copepods, their fecal pellets are pretty much the same shape and size. So that was one thing that I really had to be careful of um, when I'm sampling is that I'm kind of making sure that I'm not collecting pellets that are already in the water from things like worms. So kind of avoiding that by sampling mostly in the mid channel where the water is relatively deep. So it would be not impossible, but pretty rare for those pellets to make it all the way up to where I'm sampling. Um, but that was definitely one of the concerns that was raised by um, some of my committee members when we were early on in my project development, for sure. Awesome, cool. Um, okay, we, let's see, we have another question of how deep do the zooplankton go when they migrate to deeper waters? Um, so that depends on the species. So some of them can move, you know, hundreds of meters, which is pretty incredible when you think about it, but then others will kind of stay within like 20 meters of the surface. So it really depends. Um, the sunlight is absorbed by the ocean relatively quickly. So most sunlight is absorbed by 200 meters depth. So when you're getting into the deep waters, most of these copepods and other zooplankton are pretty well camouflaged by darkness by not going very far into the ocean at all. Um, so it really depends on the species. The ones that I'm studying, the ecosystem itself, like where I'm sampling is like not even 50 feet. So these animals are definitely not vertically migrating that far. Unfortunately, I can't tell you for certain how far they do go in the York River because I'm only sampling at the surface, but that would be something I would love to do if I had a little bit more time here for sure. Awesome, yeah. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, okay, let's see. Someone asked, how often do individual zooplankton need to perform dio-vertical migration? Do they need to eat every day or can they go for long periods of time without feeding? That's a great question. Um, so most of them move up and down daily, but then there's also certain species, like even if they do move up and down daily for most of the year, um, they're, uh, it's called ontogenetic migration, but it basically means that during certain stages of their life, they remain in the deep water. So for example, they'll um, release eggs and the eggs will sink down into the deep water where when they emerge from the egg, the young are protected by darkness. And then they actually stay in the deep waters and then they move up into the surface waters as they grow and get stronger and more able to pro basically, you know, avoid being eaten basically. Um, so it really depends on the species, but most are doing, yeah, a daily migration. So they're coming up once during the, um, the sun down and then going back down when the sun comes back up. But some of them actually reverse migrate. So they move up into the surface waters during the day and then they move down at night because they're actually trying to avoid the predators that are migrating. So it's actually a really complicated process, but kind of cool. <laughs> Very neat. That's awesome. Well, I think we've come to the end of our question period. There are a few questions we didn't get to, um, but I'm sure Kristen would be happy to either answer them afterwards or, or type answers back to them. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted a question. Even if we didn't read your question, you'll still be entered into the prize drawing. Um, so with that, we'll um, bring Savannah back up to introduce our next speaker. That was a really fun Q&A session. Who doesn't love plankton poop? Our second speaker of the night is Kayla Cahoon a second year master's student in the physical sciences department at VIMS. Kayla received her bachelor's in geology from William and Mary. And if she could be any marine animal, she would be a loggerhead turtle because they are big, beautiful, and rare. Let's welcome Kayla to the screen. Thank you so much, Savannah. Um, so welcome everybody. I thank you for thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, my the title of my talk is reinterpreting 120,000 years of sea level change, and then asking the question of why it matters. Um, this is my this is some of the motivation and background uh, research to my thesis here at VIMS, and obviously it's all about sea level change. Um, but my work, my work on sea level looks backwards rather than forwards in an effort to understand the mechanisms of sea level and how and why and where sea level changes. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what we do know and why sea level changes. 
So there are three main ways that sea level can change. The first is by changing the ocean water itself. So we can change the way that the water is moving and that process pushes and pulls water around the world or around the oceans itself. We can also change the ocean water's chemistry, and by that I mean we can make it warm or cold, or we can change its density, causing it to expand or contract. The second change that we see is in the, in the size and shape of the ocean basin, basin itself. And this is mostly a tectonic process that takes literally hundreds of thousands of years to happen, so we're not going to talk a lot more about it. Um, the third way that ocean, the sea level can change is by actually changing things on the land. Now this is things like growing glaciers, which actually, which traps water from the ocean on land. So it actually removes volume of water from the oceans. But it has a secondary effect, it has a secondary effect called isostasy. And the isostasy is the key component of sea level change that I'm studying. So let's talk about what is isostasy. It's this crazy word. So this is a simple little schematic that was developed by Boone et al. in 2018 to tell you how it works. And the basic, the basic theory is this. Water is heavy. It's very heavy. And when you have seven miles worth of an ice sheet on land, it causes the physics of the, ocean, of the Earth's surface to change. So the best way to, do, to explain this is imagine you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you take your finger and you push straight down in the middle of that sandwich. Well, where you're pushing actually sinks because, not surprising, you're pushing on it. But the edges actually flex up because of that pressure. It's a flat surface and when you push down on one, the edges flex upwards. In this example, or on Earth, we call that a four bulge. And when we have a four bulge, it, it appears as though sea level is falling because the land is actually rising. Now, when those ice sheets, when those ice sheets retreat, this, this process reverses and the sea level falls, or I'm sorry, land level falls and it appears as though sea level is rising relative to the land. Now, this process sounds a little crazy, but it is one of the, it is probably the biggest driver of sea level change and has the ability to affect sea level by hundreds of feet. Yes, you heard me right, hundreds of feet worth of sea level change due to just this one mechanism alone. And in fact, we've found that along the Mid-Atlantic Bight, which is this area from Cape Hatteras in North Carolina to Cape Cod in Massachusetts, this little curved area here, um, that a combination of change in ocean temperature and glacial isostasy are accounting for 85% of the sea level change that we're seeing in this area. That's a lot. That's pretty significant. But the crazy part is that we don't really understand it. We know it's happening and we have satellites that are able to measure it in real time, but we don't understand how long this process takes, how long it takes for the Earth to get back to equilibrium. And we know that it can do hundreds of meters, but we don't know what that maximum threshold is. How high can it actually go? So I, my project seeks to understand that, that process. So not surprisingly, I went to the Mid-Atlantic Bight to study this. And specifically, I went to the Virginia Eastern Shore, which is the southernmost extent of the Delmarva Peninsula. That's in this bottom left. Now, what you're seeing here in the center is a geologic map of the Virginia Eastern Shore. And a geologic map is simply a map that tells you all the different, in this case, sedimentary units. So each color on that map represents a Set a, a set of sea level or a set of sand and mud and clays that were deposited at a time when sea level was higher than it is today and it stayed high for a long time. We call those sea level high stands. You'll notice that on the ocean side, there are four sea level high stands the Accomac Formation, the Joins Neck Sand, the Wachapreek, and the Butler's Bluff Member. But of those four, only one, the Accomac Formation, was actually deposited by a recorded global sea level high stand. The other four occurred when global sea level was much lower, but when global sea level was lower, but along the mid-Atlantic bite, it was high due to iso isostatic response. And specifically that happened in the last 120,000 years. So I, I'm studying the relationships of these sediments and their environments and the environments that they were deposited in, in order to understand when, how, and where 
those high stands happen. Now the where is obvious, we've got a map, but when and how is a little bit more challenging. So let's talk a little bit about how I do this. Now I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a walk along a beach for a second. So just kind of relax and enjoy this part of the conversation. I want you to imagine that you're standing on a beach with your toes in the water and you know, you hear the waves crashing and you smell the salt. Well, that sediment that you're standing on has a very specific characteristic. It's pretty coarse. There's frequently what you probably saw that looked like black sand. That's something we call heavy minerals. There's usually little pebbles or shell fragments or little bits and pieces of organisms like, like crabs that are along that beach. Now, if you walk up a little bit to where your towel is sitting on the berm, or even further back to where the dunes, that sand is different. It's gonna be a little bit finer. You're not gonna see as many pebbles or shells. If you make it all the way back to the dunes, you might see dune grasses or um, like little claw prints from crabs and birds and such. If you go to the other side of the dunes and the grasslands, you see a lot of little burrowing insects and you see a lot of what we call aeolian driven sediments. These are sands that are so fine that the wind can carry them. If you go a little bit further back, you end up in the marsh, and this is where you get that, that thick, gooey mud, that, that fecal pellet rich stuff that Kristen absolutely loves. That's back here, and then if you go a step further into the sound, you get even finer sediments. So we can use these sediments, we can look at the sediments that we see on the ground and understand the environment that it was deposited in. So here's the little, a little geology lesson. We have this concept called Walther's Law. Now Walther's Law states that sediments that are next to each other at a single time get stacked in geologic time. Now what that means is that just like we just went on a walk in one snapshot on one day, you can walk all the way across the beach and you can see all those sediment and, and you can see all those environments. But if you were to stand still at the exact same place and instead of walking back and forth, you fast forward or rewind time, where you're standing will experience several different environments based on how sea level is changing. So you can literally measure how the same spot has changed over time to calculate how this ocean has changed over time. And we do that by using sediment cores. So as sea level rises, the sediments get stocked from the ocean side to the sound side in a sequence that looks like this. So your beach sand is going to be at the top, you're going to have your marsh mud at the bottom, and everything is going to get stacked, everything that was stacked laterally gets stacked vertically. Now let's be honest, science isn't that easy, right? And nothing is ever as clear cut as it sounds. So sediment cores that I deal with actually are a lot more subtle and look something like this. You'll notice that there's this little, there's a pebbly bit here in the middle, and you'll see these little kind of half rounded little black stripes. Those are those heavy mineral sands. And so in this particular case, we see that this is a very high energy ocean crust. And then this at the bottom below it is more like a beach wave. So you can see that that ocean is actually encroaching on the sand or encroaching on the beach because the sediments are getting finer. So I, I don't have results to talk about yet. I will in about a year, so stay tuned. Um, but just to kind of bring it all back, I study, I, my, my primary focus is understanding this key mechanism of glacioisostasy and how it controls sea level. And I do that because isostasy is a key mechanism that is driving climate change or that is driving sea level today and um, we just don't know that much about it. And I do that by using sediment cores. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I've got my information here. I've got a great little picture of Bruce. This is our drill rig that we use to collect these sediment cores. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kayla. Awesome presentation. I feel like I just read a book or watched a movie. I learned so much about sediment changing. And before yeah. Kim kicks off the questions, I do have a question for you. Now there's a rumor that geologists like to lick rocks. And I was wondering, do you also lick rocks? And if so, why? So, okay. Um, I am a, I'm what's called a soft sediment geologist, which means that I study sand and bits and, and I, I study stuff that's not technically rocks yet. 
Um, so no, I don't lick rocks now. I, that is that does not mean that I haven't licked rocks in the past. And the reason that you do it is because the, your tongue actually has a much, much, much better sense of how big those grains are than your hand does. That shouldn't be surprising. So if you've ever gotten a grain of sand in your mouth, you can tell immediately. You're like, oh my gosh, this thing is gigantic. And then you pull it out and it's like, oh, it's a tiny little sand grain. Well, your tongue can do that with other even smaller particles that you can't see with your eye and you can't feel with your hand. And so, yeah, sediment, hard rock, sedimentary geologists lick rocks all the time. And I have, in fact, done it on several field trips. <laughs> Very nice. We're learning, learning the secrets of the trade over here. <laughs> So our first question from the audience is, how will islands in Chesapeake Bay be affected by rising sea level? Yeah, so um, the Chesapeake Bay is a little bit of a, it's, it's a little bit of an interesting system because it is, there's not a whole lot of wave energy and it might sound surprising to us who are working on the bay, but it's actually a relatively low tidal amplitude. So the islands that are in the bay are being affected more from that pure, um, that pure change of increasing the volume of water than by this, this process specifically. Um, but not very far away are the Virginia Eastern Shore Barrier Islands, those like Chincoteague and Assateague, and if you've ever gone to see the wild horses or anything like that. Um, and those are changing at an incredible rate. Um, I know that Fishing Point, uh, Fishing Point is the southernmost extent of Asa Woman, is actually growing at a rate of 15 feet per year. Yeah, 15 feet per year. And then there's another island, Cedar. Cedar Island is migrating landward at about the same rate. And so these guys are very much so stepping backwards and working closer to the mainland. Wow. That's very quickly, cool. very quickly. It'll be amazing to see, kind of continue to watch that area as... as yeah. Things change. Yeah. Um, so another question we've got is how much is isostasy expected to add to sea level rise in our region in the next hundred years? So that's actually part of what I'm trying to answer. We don't know. We don't know is the simple answer. Um, we know that it's related to the growth and decay of ice sheets. So, and we know that the ice sheets are almost completely gone. So, um, if we continue to melt the northern hemisphere ice the way that we are, then glacioisostatic will eventually reach equilibrium or basically where that mass isn't pushing down and enough time has passed that it's back to flat across. Um, there are estimates that say that'll happen in the next 50 years. There are estimates that say that it'll take a thousand years. We honestly don't know. Um, we don't know. We don't know the driving forces behind those equations and we don't know what the magnitude of control each of those pieces has. So that's, that's kind of the point of what I'm doing is to try to understand that, just how and when. Gotcha, absolutely. Um, so yes, this question is, is similar. So if seawater temperature and density and isostasy cause 85% of sea level rise in the Mid-Atlantic Bight region, mm -hmm. how much of that is due to those two different pieces? Yeah, and so, specifically, I think they're asking also about like uh, anthropogenic versus natural sure, as well. Sure, sure. So, um, so right now, okay, let's, so you got a couple different questions. So um, the, the equation breaks out that 40% of the sea level change that we're seeing right now is, ex is specifically ocean surface temperature. It's not so much density, but it's ocean surface temperature. Um, that upper hundred meters is warming at such a at such a high rate that it is caught it is causing significant swelling. Um, and then the other forty five percent is the glacioisostatic adjustment, where we are just kind of in the sweet spot of right on the top of that four bulge. So um, forty five percent of our change is that. Um, how as far as how much of it is anthropogenic, I, I guess it depends on how zoomed out you go. Um, my, my hunch is that all of it is anthropogenic because based on all the external forcings, we should be entering into an ice age, which should be causing glaciers to expand. So, and it should be causing the earth to cool our atmosphere based on Milankovitch cycles and all these different things that control earth's climate, we should be cooling. And if we were cooling, then we wouldn't have 
isostatic adjustment that's causing sea level to rise because the land is falling. Whoa. That's huge. <laughs> kind of terrifying, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Also, just I realized that I maybe should have defined anthropogenic, just, um, just oh. things that are caused by humans, um, yep. or processes that are caused by humans. Just wanted to, wanted to clarify that for anybody. Sure. Um, and a question that I'm excited to ask you, because I know that it's part of your research, is how are you dating these deposits? So I'm using a technique called optically stimulated luminescence or OSL dates. Um, and basically this work, OSL works by measuring alpha, beta, and gamma particles that are trapped in the crystalline structure of quartz after it's been buried. So there's enough thermal energy in sunlight that these particles aren't, um, that the quartz grain is, or the quartz crystalline lattice is essentially cleared. Um, but once it's buried, um, alpha, beta, and gamma particles from radioactivity in the surrounding environment, specifically if there are any geologists out there, specifically from uh, mica and feldspar, they're releasing these get these particles that get trapped in that lattice and we can measure how much we can measure the, the how much radioaction radioactivity there is in the environment and then compare how many particles are trapped in that crystalline lattice and um, come up with a dose rate and an age since that sediment was buried. Oh, I had myself muted there for a second. That's amazing. Um, and thank you for giving that explanation. And our last question um, for Kayla for the evening. Um, so Nash, uh, you said you, we can see the ocean encroaching because the sediments are getting finer. Would you mind explaining that slide again, just kind of how Walther's Law plays out and what you see? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, hold on, let me go to it again. I'm sorry, y'all, I've got animations, slides with animations. So um, what you're actually looking at here is what we call a spit development. Um, if you've ever been to Cape Hatteras, that's a spit where it, you've got this long island and then there's this weird hooked part at the end. You can see them on Google Earth all the time. That little hook is called a spit. Now spits are actually the last deposits from longshore transport. So that is now subaerially exposed. So th because those spit deposits are on top of beach deposits, we know that sea level is lowering because if sea level were rising, then the beach deposit the the beach deposits would be on top of these spit deposits. So it, like I said, it's not as easy as it sounds, but it look we're looking at sequences. We're looking at well the ocean had to be here in order for this sediment to be like this and then it changes and how did the ocean change in order to change that sediment awesome all right well i think we've we've come to the end um we'll pass it off to the next presenter but kayla thank you so much for your time here our third and final speaker for the night is challen hyman a second year phd student in the fisheries department at bims and is also a willard a van engel fellow Challen earned his bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Florida. If he could be any marine animal, he would also be a turtle because they seem to have a really laid back life. Challen, the screen is yours. All right. Hey guys, uh, how's it going? My name is Challen Hyman and uh, like, uh, like Savannah said, I'm a PhD student at the uh, Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And I'm gonna talk to you guys about some crabs in some marshes. Now, first and foremost, uh, a little bit of context is important. Blue crabs are really important ecological and ecologically and economically. Blue crabs are really important species, both in the Chesapeake Bay and in other coastal systems where they reside. In most coastal ecosystems, they're really important benthic predators, meaning that they eat a lot of these organisms right here. Things like amphipods, which are tiny crustacea, bivalves, things like clams, polychaete, different types of worms, and detritus, or decaying plant material. But in addition, blue crabs are actually prey themselves for a lot of important fish species, things that we like to eat, such as uh, red drum and striped bass, and other fish, such as uh, northern pufferfish and spot. But there's one more predator that, uh, that blue crabs, or that are important in consuming blue crabs, and that's us. In fact, in the Chesapeake Bay, the uh, blue crab fishery is one of the most important in this region, accounting for around $219 million a year. So conserving these animals and their populations is really important because one, they're important and integral in our ecosystems and they're important in our economies. 
Now I'm gonna switch gears on you guys a little bit and talk about the blue crab life cycle because like a lot of estuarine invertebrates, uh, blue crabs have a really, really complicated one. Like all organisms, life starts with mating. And after, uh, after mating, juvenile, or after mating, uh, female blue crabs will migrate to the mouth of estuaries where they will release their larva. Now, after these larvae are swept out onto the, on the continental waters for a period of time, they are gradually brought back into estuaries where they eventually settle into these different types of nursery habitats. After they settle into these different types of nursery habitats, they eventually continue their growth and development where they can actually recruit to adult populations and we can actually, actually fish them. Now, what's important here are these nursery habitats, and this is the focus of a lot of my research. Now, you might be asking, what is a nursery habitat? And broadly speaking, a nursery habitat is a habitat that disproportionately contributes mo uh, many individuals to adult populations. And they do that because of a number of really important types of characteristics. In, some, in a lot of nurseries, what you see is that they provide a lot of places to hide, so a structural refuge for juvenile animals. And what that basically means is that if you're a predator and you're hunting for these juveniles, you can't access them because there are all these nooks and crannies in these habitats that these juvenile animals can hide in that can escape from predators. Now, in addition to all of that, remember that I mentioned that blue crabs really like to eat these different types of clams and polychaetes and amphipods. And that's really great because in these nursery habitats, there's also a lot of food. And so if you're a blue crab and you're coming back in from those, uh, that continental shelf uh, as larva and you settle into one of these nursery habitats, the odds of you surviving and making it to that adult population are really, really high. So crabs tend to really like these types of nursery habitats. Now, contrast that with uh, something that isn't a good nursery habitat, something like, for example, unstructured sand. Now, in contrast to a seagrass habitat, unstructured sand doesn't have a lot of places to hide. So if you're a predator and you're hunting for blue crabs and you're in unstructured sand, odds are you're going to pick them off really quickly and you're going to eat them very fast. And in addition to that, you might also notice that there aren't as many clams or amphipods or uh, polychaete worms for juvenile blue crabs to eat in these habitats meaning that there aren't a lot of places to hide and there's not a lot of food in these habitats. So if you're a larva and you settle out of suspension into a non-nursery habitat, the odds of you making it to uh, surviving to those adult populations are really, really small. Now, you might have noticed that I used seagrass as my example here for what a nursery habitat is. And that's because nursery habit or seagrasses are basically the pri considered the primary nursery habitat for juvenile blue crabs in both the Chesapeake Bay and in other coastal ecosystems. And as you can see, this is because of those two characteristics that I just mentioned. If you can look in there, there that's a really dense grass bed. And so if you're a predator, it's going to be really hard for you to try and get in there and consume a small blue crab. In addition, the, these seagrass meadows host a whole variety of communities just filled to the brim with stuff that juvenile blue crabs like to eat. And again, if you're a juvenile blue crab and you land in this habitat, the odds of you surviving and making it to those adult populations are really, really high. Now, bringing this all back into the blue crab life cycle, again, after spending some time out in coastal waters off on the continental shelf, these zoea and megalope, different larval stages for blue crabs, migrate back into these estuaries where they settle into these nursery habitats. And as we've just gone over, in the Chesapeake Bay in particular, the dominant nursery habitat for juvenile blue crabs is seagrass meadows. And again, this is really important because if, you're, if you, we don't have juvenile blue crabs, we don't have larger blue crabs, and we don't have those individuals recruiting to the adult populations where we can fix them and where we can consume them so they wind up on our dinner plate. So if we lose seagrass, we lose these nursery habitats and we no longer are able to fish these organisms. So it's important that we keep these nursery habitats. Now I tell you all of this because there's a little bit of bad news here. And that is that seagrass is threatened in the Chesapeake Bay due to stress. Now, what stresses seagrass out? Current events. And in fact, the current event that I'm talking to you guys about here is temperature stress related to climate change. Now, the dominant or the primary species of uh, seagrass in the Chesapeake Bay, something called zostra or eelgrass, has a very specific temperature preference. And as a result, because of warming waters in the Chesapeake Bay due to climate change, zostra is reaching its uh, temperature maximum. 
basically what that means is that as temperatures continue to warm, those zoster meadows in the Chesapeake Bay are going to continue to decline through time. And that means that we are effectively losing that nursery habitat for juvenile blue crabs as well as other juvenile animals. So that leads me to my research and my research question, which are focused on evaluating alternative nursery habitats for juvenile blue crabs specifically and for other juvenile organisms more broadly. And specifically, I'm focused on marsh habitat. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that marsh habitat checks all the boxes for what we would consider to be a really important primary nursery habitat. The first is that there are lots of places to hide, both in this marsh grass right along the shoreline that's continually inundated by high tide. There are plenty of places for blue crabs to hide. But similarly, at low tide, when the marsh is a little bit more exposed, this eroding peat here at the bottom, that detrital habitat or decaying plant material, is also really structurally complex, meaning that it has tons of places to hide, both in low tide and high tide, if you're a juvenile animal. Now, similarly, just like that seagrass habitat, marsh grass has a ton of food. Lots of different bivalves, those clams, those amphipods, those worms. So this is also a great candidate habitat. So it checks all the boxes for what we consider to be a great nursery. The next question is, is it crab approved? And that's what I'm actually studying and researching right now. Now, what I'm working on specifically are in three different rivers on the west coast of the Chesapeake Bay the York, the James, and the Rappahannock River. And the reason I'm focused on these rivers specifically is because these house all of these nursery habitats or candidate nursery habitats that uh, we have just talked about. Marsh, seagrass, and unstructured, unvegetated sand. That's not a nursery habitat, but a great control to compare these other ecosystems to. And just to give you an idea of how small these organisms are, most of these juvenile blue crabs are less than 20 millimeters across, meaning less than half an inch and often less than a quarter of an inch, an inch in size. So these are really, really small organisms. And what my research is beginning to find is that yes, if you're a uh, blue crab larva and you're coming in off that continental shelf, you're going to want to settle into seagrass meadows if you have the chance. That is definitely their uh, preferred nursery habitat. However, seagrass distributions in the bay aren't uh, very large considering all of the other potential shoreline habitats that's in the bay. And so odds are a lot of these larvae are going to be swept right past seagrass meadows and kind of miss their bus stop, so to speak. When this happens, oftentimes these larvae are going to try and settle in the next best habitat they can find. And what we're finding is that's often seagrass meadows. However, I'm sorry, often marsh meadows, excuse me. However, if these larvae miss both seagrass meadows and salt marsh ecosystems, what's going to happen is they're going to land in that unvegetated, unstructured sand habitat. And the odds of surviving in that habitat are really small compared to these other two. Now, so effectively, what we have here is a, a new hypothesis at least in the Chesapeake Bay. Effectively, instead of just having one potential great nursery habitat for juvenile blue crabs, we have two. We have this additional habitat, salt marsh ecosystems, which blue crabs can utilize to continue their life cycle in order to make it to the adult populations so that we can fish and continue to enjoy them on our dinner plates. So, whoop. So, to bring it home, as we lose seagrass meadows due to thermal stress or heat stress as a result of climate change, blue crabs are probably going to increasingly rely on alternative nurseries uh, in the Chesapeake Bay and in other northern habitats. Salt marshes, according to preliminary evidence, appear to be important alternative nurseries for juvenile blue crabs. And so preservation of salt marshes in the Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere is really important if we're going to continue having blue crabs in, the, in these waters. Because again, we're probably going to lose that seagrass habitat going forward in the next 10, 20, or 30 years as the water continues to heat up. And so thanks again for coming to my talk tonight. And before I go, I want to switch gears a little bit, because in addition to nursery habitats, there's something else that's near and dear to my heart. And that is to, ooh, that's a bad typo, ditch your vocabulary with a vocabulary. Now, there are a lot of different types of terms that are kind of worn out. Things you might want to consider, such as uh, fabulous, that's an old term. Instead of looking fabulous today, what about looking crabulous today? That is so much fresher. It just rolls off the tongue, right? And then in addition, awesome, that's played out. That's an older adjective. What about clawsome? Look at how great that is. 
fantastic. And similarly, instead of incredible, you can move into incrabable. So again, replacing these older adjectives with more crab positive puns. However, again, fantastic can be moved into crabtastic, but you don't necessarily have to have uh, positive po adjectives to replace these with your crab vocabulary, or again, your vocabulary. So awful, similarly, can be replaced with clawful. And then just uh, law and order, so going into some of our popular television shows, can be replaced with claw and order. Shout out to uh, Jeff Shield, who's in the audience today, who I shamelessly took off of the shirt. And then finally, if we're going to be looking, talking about captivating talks, maybe talking about crabdivating talks, so that you can tell your friends today that maybe Challen gave a very crabdivating talk to you guys this evening. That is all. I will no longer torture you guys with any more uh, terrible puns, but I would just like to uh, thank everyone again for coming to my talk tonight. And uh, for questions, I would like to refer to you to uh, Susan, our skateboarding crab. And then before I go, I would uh, just like to thank my funding source, the Willard Van Engel or Wave Fellowship, which is uh, keeping me uh, going here at VIMS. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, back to you, Savannah. Now that was a crabtastic presentation. Thank you so much, Challen. Now before we get to the crowd's questions, I have a question myself. I've been so curious. Crabs are very quick. So how do you catch them in the marsh? That is a uh, fantastic question. Let me move past these uh, animations and actually take you guys to my crab trap. We are actually testing out and are currently working on something called a flume trap. So uh, yeah, as you pointed out, they're really quick and marsh grass is really, really hard to sample. So effectively what we do is we actually set up these uh, effective rows of netting with a little cot end or a mesh net at the bottom. And what happens is when the, uh, the tides are high, so crabs are actually using the marsh grass, we set up these nets. And what happens is that the crabs don't like to be exposed in low tide. And so as the tide lowers, these crabs will move back down into the uh, shallow detrital habitat right at the base of the marsh, and they get caught in this net right here. And so it's a really cool little uh, trick in order to uh, catch them. And we're actually finding that it's uh, pretty effective. Uh, seagrass meadows, just for comparison, have about uh, 40 small crabs per square meter, so pretty dense. And uh, unvegetated sand has about one crab for every 10 meters, so it's pretty sparse in terms of juvenile blue crabs. We're finding that marshes have around 13, 10 to 13 crabs per square meter, which isn't as much as seagrass, but it's definitely nowhere near as sparse as uh, unvegetated sand. And when you consider how, how much marsh grass is in uh, some of these uh, tributaries or rivers, it greatly um, over, quickly overwhelms uh, the number of crabs that are being hosted currently in uh, seagrass meadows. Now that's crab debating. <laughs> Oh, the puns are rolling thick tonight. Um, thank you, Chad. That was an awesome presentation. And I um, actually answered a bunch of people were curious about how you catch your um, juvenile crabs. So that was a great uh, question from Savannah as well. Um, so our first audience question, someone asked, so why are blue crab larvae released into the open water first versus like being released directly into nursery habitats? What, what's this whole life history thing going on? Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, yeah, uh, so effectively what happens is this is their uh, sort of their entire uh, life history strategy. Uh, if you're a uh, predator of a juvenile blue crab or, or juvenile blue crab larva, you're going to kind of want to hang out where all the blue crabs are. And so what blue crabs have done is they've, evol they've evolved a strategy where they send all of their kids way off to boarding school out in the continental waters where there aren't actually any predators for them. And then gradually, once they get a little bit bigger, and so they get too big for some of these smaller predators' mouths, so they literally can't bite them, then they gra gradually come back into the continental, or back into the estuary, where they then settle out and continue their life cycle. So it's this giant strategy just to effectively evade some of these predators that like to eat uh, blue crab larvae. Awesome. Well, that, it's a convoluted but effective mechanism. Hey, it works um, for them. <laughs> um, we have a, a couple different questions that are kind of around, um, are salt marshes threatened by some of the same factors that threaten eelgrass beds or um, how, what kind of, what's the outcome or the outlook for salt marshes in general from climate change? That's another awesome question. So going back one slide, 
Um, so effectively, seagrasses in the Chesapeake Bay are a uh, cold loving species. That zostera, that eelgrass, is uh, really going to be threatened by climate change and warming waters. Marshes uh, exist all down, well down into the equator. So they're not really going to be affected by temperature stress. However, the thing that's actually going to be affecting marshes is coastal development. And so uh, that's where we're actually losing a lot of our salt marshes. And so there are a couple of things you can do if you are a, uh, someone who lives on the water in one of these tributaries. The first is that if you already live on the water and you have a seawall, consider switching that out to a living shoreline which has some of these marsh grasses return and allows that area to, look, uh, to sort of um, come back and function as that nursery habitat once again. If you are looking to move to a uh, waterfront property and are thinking about developing, instead of creating that uh, that seawall or mowing over your back this marsh grass and creating a backyard consider instead doing a boardwalk uh, personally and I might be a little bit biased but I think an intact marsh is way prettier than anything uh, that could resemble a lawn and so uh, these are things that we can do to sort of pre preserve these marsh grasses so that they are not going to see the declines that we're probably going to see with seagrass meadows awesome well thank you um all right, so we got a question. Do you have any kind of get, uh, you know educated guess onto the density of crabs that can be supported in marshes compared to seagrass beds? And then there's a follow-up uh, question from this person of how long does it take a crab to reach market size? <laughs> um, oh man, I don't think I know that one off the top of my head. Um, but the as far as the densities of these different animals, I kind of touched on it before when I was going into how to catch them. But uh, effectively, again, what we're finding is that around 40 blue crabs, small blue crabs per square meter are found in uh, seagrass meadows. Around 10 to 15 are found in marsh fringe habitat. And then compare that to uh, habitats that aren't nurseries, like unstructured sand, which you find maybe one every 10 square meters. So these are definitely a lot more important habitats than than, uh, than these non-nurseries. And uh, again, if I can go forward and move past these animations. If you can look over here to the uh, left side of the screen here, you can kind of get an idea for even though that uh, seagrasses don't, or seagrasses support more juvenile blue crabs per square meter, when you look at the actual area of some of these habitats, salt marshes are much much more expansive, especially in the York River where these maps are, uh, compared to seagrass meadows. And so uh, even though, sea even though uh, marsh grasses support a little bit less, maybe one fourth the density of blue crabs and sea compared to seagrass meadows, just the sheer amount of marsh grass might make them actually a more important nursery habitat. And that's some of the things we're beginning to find now. That's amazing. Um, super cool to see how your research continues to play out. I think we've kind of come to the end of our time, um, but to anyone who didn't get your question answered, um, regardless of the presenter, um, feel free to email outreach, um, the outreach email for VIMS, um, and we can forward those questions on to the presenters. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them over email as well. Um, Challen, thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, sorry, I just got the email. It's programs at vims.edu. Thank you, Candice. Um, so yes, so you can email any additional questions to programs at vims.edu and we will make sure those get to our presenters. Um, thank you, Challen, for a wonderful presentation and for um, some really thoughtful answers to those uh, questions from our audience. And with that, we will pass it back to Savannah for our, our closing out of our event this evening. Thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. And I would once again like to thank our sponsors at First Advantage Federal Credit Union, Chesapeake Bake, Hog Funeral Home, Langling Federal Credit Union, Rick and Libby's, and Whitley's Peanut Factory. We truly appreciate all of your support. All right, and that concludes our event for this evening. Um, congratulations to our prize winners. Thank you to our presenters and our sponsors and everyone who tuned in. Um, we're really excited that we get to share um, our graduate students work with all of you uh, and we'll hope to see you at our next VIMS event. Have a great night.